So, we are in 2 Timothy. We have been walking through 2 Timothy for, well, what was going to be four weeks is now seven. And we're in the middle of, verse, of chapter two. But I mentioned this last week that I've always, I've always admired Peter. I've always, you know, kind of admired Paul, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter. But since we we're looking at the book of Acts, I've just I've kind of fallen in love with the transparency transparency of the Apostle Paul. I mean, his his one one phrase is "Be all things for all people," and he lived and died by that truth. When he was a non-believer, when he was he was killing Christians and he was trying to crawl up the ladder of the Pharisees and, and the Romans and the Sadducees and all that, he did it to to, to the nth degree. He, he dedicated his life to making sure that, that what he had taken on as a responsibility was, was the most important thing in his life. And when Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and called him into salvation, called him into, into a relationship with, with himself, with, with God, and gave him a mission, and his life mission changed from, from murdering Christians, holding cloaks, and making sure that, that you know, he, was, he was the power to being the probably the greatest human spokesperson for Christ the world has ever known. And so when we look at Timothy, Timothy is, is a pastoral letter, a pastoral epistle. So he's writing to a young pastor, and, and most of you, if you've been here, know this, but, but Timothy's got some issues. He, he's not as outspoken. He's not as bold as, as what Paul believes he should be. And certainly what the world needs him to be, his congregation, his city needs him to be. And so Paul challenges him to be bolder and to be stronger, not by his own accord, but by the power of God. And so he implores him over 25 times to be strong, to be stronger than you could ever be. But Paul's not saying you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's you surrender more fully, you surrender completely, you, you, you walk that narrow path, and, and, and in that, you, you, you voice and you, you share the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ is the way to God, he's the way to salvation, to forgiveness of, of sin. And so in 2 Timothy, this is the second, because it's 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, it's the second letter to Timothy, but when Paul's writing this letter, he's writing it literally on his deathbed, even though he doesn't know exactly when he's going to die. Nero has basically set the world on fire. He's blamed the Christians. Paul is one of the Christians. He's thrown in prison. Um, he, he will die shortly thereafter. And so he's writing basically his last will and testament to Timothy, to the church, to the church then and to the church now, about the significance and the importance of keeping the main thing the main thing, and keeping the only person, the only person, and that is Jesus Christ. And so he tells him numerous times to, to be faithful to the gospel. Now I want to pick up in verse 11 this morning, because he's shifting. He's given him his theology, his philosophy, his, 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 his whys, and then he does what we do, and I don't know if you guys know this or not, but what I'm going to read is actually an old Hebrew song, and it could be a chorus that, that they sang or, or, or that we sang, but Paul, in his, in his pastoral ap, um, apostolic leadership, I, I think he knows, and I believe, I mean, Scripture really fleshes this out, that hearing is one thing. But God is always speaking to us in ways that we can hear. For me, he speaks volumes through music. Always has, always will. And hopefully in heaven, I'll, there'll still be music. Because music is... <laughs> I was going to do... <laughs> Never mind. <clears throat> My brain. A Stevie Wonder song. And I don't want to go there, so it's really not appropriate. <laughs> But Paul says this, he says, it is a trustworthy statement. And the song begins, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. 
if we are faithless. He remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So it's a song, it's lyrics, but it's also pretty good theology. And so he's, he's, he's ushering this, this, this letter, this conversation, that, this one-sided conversation he's having with Timothy. And he's saying, first of all, understand that, that, that what has been said and what is being said and what, what, what will be said, y- you need to listen to that. It's a trustworthy statement. Paul was, was never one to shy away from, from this is who I was, this is who I am, and, and this, is, this is who God expects me to be. And so you need to trust that I am the apostle that Jesus saved on the road to Damascus, that I am, I am the one that, that he gave the marching orders to, to go into a world that, that Peter and the other, other Hebrew um, apostles really weren't, weren't privy to at that time, that Paul's lot in life was to go to literally a lost and dying world that was at odds with them. And so he's saying, you need to, you need to, to, to trust me but you also need to trust the word and you need to trust the theology and the doctrine. But with the doctrine and the theology comes the, comes the walking, comes the living, comes the, the, the habitual lifestyle of, of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so he says these things. He says, you know, if we died with him, we'll also live with him. You know, there's really two ways to look at that. And again, this is a song, but it's still scripture. There's two, two ways Christians die. We're buried with him in baptism and raised to walk with him in newness of life. So that's one way. Or we are, are martyr, martyred or, or, or we die for, for Jesus and for the kingdom of God. Paul's probably referencing the, the latter. That there is a, a, a suffering, a, a dying that certainly was going to take place in his generation, in, in his is decade, because most of the Christians who were, who were subjects of Rome, for the most part, were, were going to either be extremely oppressed or, or, or they would be martyred. They would be put to death. And so he says, in the song, if we die with him, we'll also live with him. This life is not life. This is existence. He promises us eternal life in him when we breathe our last breath or or Jesus returns, that that, that trumpet sounds and, 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 and we go and be with him. That's when true life begins. But this is all that we know. And that's the hard part, is is we can read about glimpses of heaven, eternity with, with God and his kingdom, but he's left us here in the flesh which is, is fallen, is dying. And he's saying, I want you, I expect you, you will live for me. You will walk with me. Because if it's truly good news to you, if it's truly the gospel message, then, then Christian church, then we realize that, that whatever happens in this life is only temporary. You know, you can only be killed once. I've never experienced that. You know how I know? Because I'm here. We all are alive, and, and God expects his children to live their life for him. Just re- remember when you were a kid. Most of us are seasoned. But I, I grew up with pretty strict parents. Wouldn't you say, well, I've got a twin brother back there, right? Yeah, yeah. Pretty strict. And you know, when we chose not to do what we were told, they said, oh, it's okay, boys. You guys just go ahead and do whatever you want to because you guys know what's best. Not even close. Not, that never was a thought. It's like, you behave or you will pay the consequences. And I grew up being spanked. <laughs> I mean, that's to say nothing other than it worked for me. It worked for my brothers. And again, having a twin brother, he got all the blame because I always blamed him for everything. It's true. But his parents 
we expect our children to behave, right? Because God has given us as parents the responsibility of training up a child in the way in which he should go so that when he's old, he won't depart from it. Guess what? That's scripture. So he gives parents the responsibility of, of, of equipping their children the best way they can so that when they are old enough, mature enough, that they go and live their own life. All of that's true for the Christian, that we're being trained, we're being raised, we're being, we're being nur nurtured, but not to live our own life, but to live the life that God has given, given us and granted us for his kingdom, for his name's sake. And so Paul is going, Timothy, if we endure, verse 12, if we endure with him, we, we reign with him. We sang victory in Jesus. He says this life is going to be tough. This life is, 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 is going to eat you up and spit you out. But this is only temporary. I mean, the Son of God was, was nailed to a cross. And he was, he was murdered for us, <laughs> for our sake. And so Paul says, endure. Because when you endure, then, then he knows where we are. God knows exactly where we are. But there's, there's this assurance that comes when we're faithful. When the walk is legitimate, he gives us that, that, that surety. Because he's left the Holy Spirit in our, in our lives. He, he imbibes everyone who's, who's confessed Christ as the Lord and is a believer. And so we have that assurance. But then he says in the end of verse 12, if we deny him, he will deny us. I think that pretty much speaks for itself. A true child of God won't deny that he's a true child of God. But see, there's a lot who, who say they believe, but they don't. And their life doesn't flesh that out. They don't, they don't live for Jesus. So Paul's just telling his, his, his preacher boy, if you will, these are things you need to be mindful of. And then, But he didn't just write it to Timothy because we're reading it. So we have to know that there's value in Scripture because there's always value in Scripture. Because it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts to the heart of the matter, to our heart. And then he says this. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. I, I, think, I think this is probably the most important phrase in, in this section is that God cannot be faithless. God cannot be contrary to his character. It's impossible for God not to be loving. It's impossible for God, for God not to be just. It's impossible for God not to be who God is. And he defines who he is. We don't get a say in that. And I know we want to, because we like to think we're in control, but, but it doesn't happen that way. We might be faithless, and God draws us to himself, but God will always be faithful, even if we don't believe he is. And if you don't believe he is, then there is a, a, a very simplistic issue, a problem in your life, because it's about trusting God. If we trust him for heaven, we trust him for eternity, then we, we have to trust him for now. We have to. Because if not, then, then what are we really trusting him for? What's the song, In the Sweet By and By? Well, you better hope it's sweet by and by, because that's, again, another lyric. But God says that there, there's an expectation for those that are God's children, and it's a glorious homecoming. He says there'll be no more tears, no more crying, no more pain. Praise God. But it's not today. I know. And it hurts. And it's sad. But that is life. 
And then Paul says this, verse 14. Remind them, this is the pastor reminding the pastor, the apostle reminding, reminding, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle with words. I love that verse. Which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. So let me, let me be really frank, really as transparent as I can. The word of God is the word of God. It says what it says. Your interpretation of the word is immaterial if it conflicts with what it really means. My interpretation of scripture is immaterial of no value if it doesn't line up with what scripture means. Now, that does not mean that we all have to learn Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. Uh, I went to seminary. I had my bouts with them. But the Bible is not open for change. It, it, it never was. But I don't believe it. It means that, well, based on what don't you believe? But I think, so, I think I'm six foot four, 240 pounds, and just muscle bound, and I, and I can run a four minute mile. I can, I, I can high jump, you know, 12 feet. I can clean a, a, clear a building in a single bound just like Superman. Oh, that's right, Superman doesn't exist. Because God's word means what it means, and, and we can't fit it in, in, into our box. And, and that's part of why Paul is writing this. And, and that's why he's, why he's saying, he's saying, remind them of the gospel message. Remind them of who this world, this life, this Christianity is about. It's not about us. We're the blessed ones. It's about Jesus. It's about God. And that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. That he forgives sin. He draws that which is those who, who are lost and broken. And he says, I bring healing to you. Praise God. I, I remember. I remember as a teenager. Man, I was raised in church, but I, I remember my salvation experience, that moment in time when I professed Jesus as Lord. I can always go back there. When I was wandering far and wide and, and, and living life for a, I, I, I would go back and I'd, I'd, I'd revisit that moment at Faith Baptist Church in Anchorage, Alaska. That moment when, when I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I surrendered my life to God. I will never forget that. And since then, there have been, have been other moments and markers in my life that I can go back to that God has, has, has made so evident and, and so real that show how faithful he is and, and, and show how, how, how real the offer of relationship truly is. That when I read, he will never leave me nor forsake me. That they're not just words. It's born out of a God who loves, a God who saves, and a God who, who, who reconciles our fear, our loss, our questions into the reality of who he is and who we are in Christ. I mean, Paul says it best, we are new creations. Well, John says, you're born again, so, I mean, baby, yeah, but Paul says you're a new creation. That God has, has knitted in you something that, that is unique, that only God can do. There's no one else like you. F physically, Roy and I look a lot alike, but even our DNA is a, a little off. We're all unique, and, and God says, you're, it's, it's, as, as Christians, as 
as my kids, as my family, you're all unique still. I didn't turn you into robots, into clones. I saved you, brought you out of, out of death into life so that, so that you, with who you are, with all of your life experience, with all the baggage, that you could be used for my kingdom. Everyone has worth in God's kingdom. This next verse, and this is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave us at the end of these two, was the second verse I ever learned as a Christian. The first one was, guess, for God so loved, John 3.16. But 2 Timothy 2.15, I'll never forget, we were upstairs in the old building of Faith Baptist Church, Alan Thornhill, what is Roy Allen, he's got to be close to the mid-80s, late-80s, something like that. He was teaching an, uh, a youth learning scripture, and he said, I want you guys to learn this. And so it's study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is what the New American Standard says. Be diligent to present yourselves, yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. The key word there would be ashamed. Have you ever been ashamed of something that you've done? Something that you, you accomplished, yet you knew just wasn't, wasn't up to your standards? You know, I, if there was a classroom situation, that was always me. I hated school. But when you... You know, you go to, you got to go to high school, at least when I was growing up, you had to go to high school, chose to go to college, chose to go to seminary. And you know what? There are requirements. You, you, you have to write papers. You have to give speeches. You have to give sermons, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, it was so easy just to skate on through. But I'll never forget my, my, my second sermon I ever preached in my, my preaching class at seminary. The, he, we were given 12 minutes and one note card. That was it. I'd never preached in my life. I, I, I had this, what is it, three by five note card, and the print was so small, I had every word on, in the whole English dictionary on that card, so it seemed. And I got up to preach, and it was the longest 12 minutes of my life. I didn't know if I was coming or if I was going, or, you know, it was, I was so embarrassed. And that embarrassment turned to shame because I knew that I wasn't being true to the calling that God had placed on my life. I knew I, most of the time I can just skate through. But at that moment, God used that moment to teach me that there are things more valuable than just getting by. There are things more valuable than just shooting from the hip. And Ray, this one didn't fail you. You failed the mission. So Paul says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, someone who puts in the work, who, who, who knows the task, who recognizes the task, and, and, and uh, agrees and undertakes that, that responsibility to, to, to an outcome that often we, we're not privy to. So it's not the outcome that matters. It's the work. And that doesn't mean we work for any, it means doing what you're supposed to do. It's got nothing to do with salvation, has nothing. It has to do with putting in what is necessary to get the results that God desires. So he says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So just in, in, in Christianity, just in the church, it's, he's talking about handling the word of God. That's why your interpretation doesn't matter. My interpretation doesn't matter. Let me, let me just throw, throw a, a verse at you, okay? Um, judge not that you be judged. So what do you think that means? Judge not, lest you be judged. Well, I, I, 
I would assume if I read that that I'm not supposed to judge you for your bad behavior, right? Right? Agree? Okay. So I, I have to be careful, right? I'm not supposed to, and, and guess what? You're not supposed to judge either, right? Agree? Just go ahead and raise your hand if you agree. Okay. But what does the next verse say? See, this is the contextual bit. Here's what verse 2 says. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So judge not lest you be judged, because however you judge, you're going to be judged by the same standards. So it's not saying don't judge, it's just saying you better be ready for how people are going to judge you. So guess what, maybe it is wise not to be judgmental. Really simple question, has anybody not sinned? Yeah, yeah, we've all done that. We've all fallen short of God's glory. That's what, that's what we do. But that doesn't have to be our identifier. Habitually living in a sinful way. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Michael, would you do me a favor? Would you go out there real quick? Thank you. Um, so we have a responsibility to accurately handle God's word. Which means this, and he says it to begin with, study to show thyself approved unto God. And if you're not spending time in God's word, then you don't know God the way you can. The way we need to. See, and, and, and here's, here's the problem when we aren't familiar enough with God's word. We begin to think it means what it doesn't mean. We begin to think that I, I can determine what the interpretation is. I can put legs and feet to this. And God says, you absolutely cannot. And then he finishes with this. This is the last one. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further godliness, ungodliness. Huh. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. Let's go back to verse 14 really quick. Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words. And then he says, this is what I just read. We fight over the stupidest things. You know, we do. As, 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 as human beings, but as the church, we fight about really immaterial things. Or things that, that are important but not important enough to be wrangled about? The color of the carpet. The color of the carpet. <laughs> How many of you grew up with pews? I remember as a kid, because we grew up in pews, I, 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 as a young, immature Christian, I prayed for chairs. <laughs> because we were in church three or four days a week sitting in those those wooden pews with, with no cushions, and, and, and it was very uncomfortable. And it was real easy for, for our mom and, and grandparents to slide on the wood if Roy be misbehaved. <laughs> and so I, you know, I just, I just prayed for chairs. But you know, I, I, I know that chairs replacing pews was a huge battle tradition. in church tradition. I ain't never done it that way before. Mm -hmm. And there's a place for some of that, but it's not here. It's not now. Now is the time when we come before God and say, God, I'm not worthy. I don't deserve what you've given me, but I'm so thankful for the life that you've granted me.
Not just that I'm not going to hell, which is a huge praise God, but that I've got hope in a world that really seems to be hopeless. And yet your word says that it's not because I'm your kid. Man, that's something to hold on to. So when we think it's hopeless, he says, just come a little closer. Just come a little bit closer. Read a little bit more. Oh, oh, Reagan, as you're reading, why don't you pray too? Why don't you live for me? And really, that's, that's what Christianity is about. And that's what church is about. It's about living for Jesus. It's about surrendering, surrendering our lives to the one and only king, the sovereign, almighty, holy God who gave his life for us. But he didn't just die for us. If he just died for us, then we'd be serving a dead savior. But he rose from the dead. That's why we celebrate Easter. It's coming up in, what, two months? Two and a half months, something like that. That Jesus defeated death. He defeated the enemies of God. He, he put an end to the consequences of, of eternal separation because of our sin. And he said, you can be heirs and joint heirs with Christ. So I'm going to ask if you'll stand with me this morning. We're going to sing. And I think it's only trust him. Is that what I picked? Only trust, him. Only trust him. See, what a great memory I've got. You guys know, probably know this. The words will be on the screen. Um, just ask that you quiet your heart. Sing if you feel like singing. But maybe do this too. Say, Lord, truly speak to me. Draw me to yourself. Because I want to be right with you this morning. So assuming you know who you are, who's cooking and is going to feed us, right? And then we're going to judge you. Judge not lest you be judged. <laughs> Kidding. Thank you for being here this morning. We're going to sing this song and then you guys have, have a wonderful week. There's lots of opportunities uh, for prayer and, and fellowshipping with, with each other this week. And deacons, don't forget tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Let's sing. Have a wonderful week. Hope to see you sometime this week. Lord bless you. Be safe going home, going to lunch. Have a wonderful day today. Enjoy the Super Bowl.